Throughout the ages, history has been altered by word of mouth and the misrepresentation of those who might not have been present when some of the world's most significant events took place. Channelers Barry and Connie Strom bring through the spirits of those who actually witnessed or took part in these historical events and lets them tell their stories in their own words. Welcome to Channeling History, and now, here are your hosts, Barry and Connie Strom. Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Channeling History. We're the only show where we speak to the souls that are on the other side of the veil, and they're the ones that made things happen. We're brought to you every Sunday on the Parax Radio Network. I'm Barry Strom, your host, and I will be speaking the words of the spirits tonight. And I'm Connie Strom, your co-host. Tonight, we'll be talking to three famous industrialists about the importance of philanthropy. Johns Hopkins and John Rockefeller were great philanthropists, and Cornelius Vanderbilt, not so much. It will be interesting to compare their judgments when they arrived on the other side. Okay, and I'd like to thank all of you for tuning into our show. We try to bring you the information based on our ability to speak with the spirits. You can hear all of our shows on our YouTube channel or download them on Potomatic.com. Now, we have no idea what our guests are going to be saying, so we're going to throw a little disclaimer in. The opinions or statements voiced on our show are the channeled words of the spirits. Do not necessarily reflect our opinions, those of the Parax Network, or of our sponsors. Now, we currently have over 430 videos available on our YouTube channel. It's in my name, Barry Strom, and you'll find all of our channeling history shows there, as well as all of our other channelings. Last week, we had a rather interesting show in which we discussed the truth in biblical passages when we channeled St. Matthew, St. John, St. Augustine, and King James. The comparison of what is written compared to interviewing the spirits that walked the earth with Jesus was very educational. The show is available on our YouTube channel, and we highly recommend it. Now, when we begin channeling tonight, as always, Connie will ask the questions, and I'll answer the questions in the words of the spirits. But before we speak with the spirits, we always say our little prayer of protection. So Connie's going to say the prayer, and we'll begin to channel with the spirits of Johns Hopkins, Cornelius Vanderbilt, and John Rockefeller. God, please grant us your wisdom and protection. Grant us the knowledge that we can handle and keep us safe from those things that will harm us. Keep the messages positive and pure love. Keep us safe from our egos. We ask these things in the light of the seen, the unseen, and the honesty of God. Amen. Okay, now we're not going to take a break tonight, but we will take questions from the chat room that pertain to our guests. As usual, we're not going to take any personal questions. So, Connie? Let's begin with the discussion questions, and we will begin with the spirit of Johns Hopkins. Welcome, Mr. Hopkins, and thank you for joining us. You were born a member of the Quaker faith. Would you tell us some details of the Quaker faith and how the religion affected your life? The Quakers, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to come through tonight. The Quaker faith is a very basic, down-to-earth faith. It's not very fancy, but it does believe that every word of the Bible is correct. It believes in the golden golden rule, believes in helping others. My, my mother was a very strong Quaker. I tried to follow her teachings. She instilled much in my life. She always told me that it was God's will that we would help others as much as we could. Even though she never had a great amount of money, she would give a percentage every week to the church. We would try to do our best. In those days, it was, which was early 1800s, in those days, religion was very, very important in everyone's lives. And the Quakers had been in Pennsylvania for quite a while. The individual, William Penn, was a Quaker. He had most of the lands in that area. 
the people were very down to earth and basically just lived very simple lives. Okay, you were born in Maryland, which is a border state with both opponents and supporters of slavery. Will you please tell us what it was like living in pre-Civil War Maryland? Maryland was very different from most of the other states. We were on the border. The people in southern Maryland had plantations. They had they were large slaveholders. The people in the cities such as Baltimore and northern and northern Maryland were more t- towards being abolitionists. Quakers were very much against slavery. They felt that every individual was equal under God. When the Civil War actually broke out, there were neighbors that were fighting against neighbors. There were military units from both the North and the South in Maryland. Maryland adjoined Virginia, and Virginia was where a vast majority of the early fighting took place. There were riots. There were people on both sides that felt very strongly about the issue. So it was it was a very difficult place to be before the Civil War, and as the Civil War was taking place, there were a lot of guerrilla fighting. Go- there was a lot of guerrilla fighting going on. The military had to protect Washington D.C., the capital, right across the Potomac River. You were in Confederate territory. So Maryland was very unique. I'm sure it was. Okay, you are known as an abolitionist. Did you ever own any slaves? I did buy a few slaves, but I did it simply so that I could set them free. I was a very staunch abolitionist, just the same as my faith demanded. I had many friends that had slaves, but I did not agree with them. Slavery was a terrible, terrible thing, and I was so very happy when President Lincoln signed the emancipation and freed them. But, yes, you could say I owned them, but it was simply so that I could set them free. Okay. During your life, you had great concern for the poor. Was it your intent that all of the institutions founded in your name were to remain free service for the poor? I tried to do as much for the poor as I could. And yes, some of the things that I set up, I wanted to have free for the people that couldn't afford it. But I also realized that someone had to pay the expenses. And even though I did have quite a bit of money, I tried to set things up as best I could. But even though I wanted to have as much for free as possible, I did realize that there were instances where people would have to pay. How did you manage to accumulate such great wealth? Well, compared to my other friends here tonight, I didn't have the greatest wealth. But I was quite wealthy. I invested in the B&O Railroad. I had many other business ventures that turned out to be very good. What you have to understand is when people have wealth, it is simply because God has blessed them and God has guided them. And God is testing them to see what they do with that great wealth. So, yes, I was very lucky, but I was also blessed. It was just simply because of the will of God that I was able to do what I did. I can see you know God very well. Why did you believe charity and philanthropy were so important in your life? It was just part of my background. I grew up and lived wanting to help others. I knew that... It was a time where people needed great help, just the same as today is a time where people need great help. It seems as though poverty never changes. People spend a lot. People try to help. But every generation has has a great poverty issue. I think that government has to take a much more realistic viewpoint towards poverty and that they have to work much harder in order to eliminate it. You established an orphanage for black children. What do you see as the greatest need for black children today? 
I see several needs for black children today. I think the first need is for the black children to have a strong family. Today we're seeing many people, both black and white, abandoning the families. They create the children and then they leave, and the mothers are responsible to raise those families. I think that education. Today, black families live in much poverty. That poverty creates higher crime, and higher crime leads to poorer educations, and poorer educations lead to higher crime. So you're seeing a spiral that takes place. I think governments have got to establish the fact that all children, regardless of color, race, creed, religion, whatever, deserve the same educational opportunities. If children are given the same opportunities and have a strong family life, they will succeed. If they are robbed of their educations and have no way of gaining employment, they can only turn to drugs, crime, violence. So I think education and strong family lives are the key to what we need. I can't argue with that. What is your opinion of segregation and the rights of African Americans today? Segregation is a terrible, terrible thing. It has come to, I'm trying to get this properly worded. The blacks still have problems. As you can see in the inner cities, their educations are not the same. But they've also maintained greater rights. They have essentially the same legal rights as any other individual. But there is still racial bias that leads to, the, to, as I just talked about, poor education. In many instances, the poverty has forced people to turn away from God. Religion used to be very important. It was part of the school system, as part of the educations. Today, people are trying to remove God from the public schools. That is a terrible, terrible thing, because it doesn't matter how you worship God, but as long as you worship him in some manner, your life will be much better than if you do not turn to him and listen to his words. What would you tell anyone accumulating great wealth today? I would tell anyone that accumulates great wealth today that they have a responsibility. There's much poverty. There's much that has not changed through the hundreds of years that our country has existed. God expects that when he blesses individuals with great wealth that those individuals return it to help others. Many people do not do that, and when they refuse that, they are not following the life plans with which they were sent back, and they are not responding properly to the blessings that were bestowed upon them. How were you greeted when you arrived on the other side? I was greeted very well. We all do things that are against God's will, but... Thankfully, mine were very minor. I stayed very close to my life plan. I tried to set up educational institutions. I tried to help others. I tried to do everything that I could with my money. I used most of my money for charities, for philanthropy, for helping others. I was highly blessed, and I returned those blessings. When you do that, you are greeted very well when you return to heaven. I was rewarded with being able to advance in the realm. I was rewarded by knowing that my next life plan will put me in a position to help others as well. So my judgment was excellent when I returned. You lived in Baltimore all your life. What do you think as you look at Baltimore today? 
As I look at Baltimore today, I am very saddened by the violence, by the drugs, by the lack of education for the poor. Baltimore has changed so much. We used to try to help individuals that needed help. We had a strong, we had strong religions, churches. We had decent schools. We had many things that helped others. Today, the government, the government of Baltimore is simply looking out for their own best interests. It seems as though they don't care about the people. Poverty is growing. Violence is terrible. Murders. My heart, my heart cries when I see what is taking place in the, the city that I love so much. The current costs for a Johns Hopkins University exceeds $60,000 per year. What is your opinion of how the university you founded has become a school for the elite? I would prefer that they had not taken the path that they do. I would prefer that they would use their endowments to help others. Now, they do have cash help for people. The fact that they take in such a small percentage is sad. There are many qualified children that, that attempt to come into John Hopkins to study, to improve their lives, and there are many that are turned away. It is very sad in many instances what is taking place in our higher educational system. The university has turned away from any type of religious education, but the hospital, the university, it still provides excellent care. It is just that it no longer provides the care for the poor that I had hoped. Yeah, in 2021, around 1,650 applicants were selected from a pool of over 33,000. What do you think about your university disappointing so many qualified students? It saddens me. But... The university has limited capacities. It is almost like it has become a, a lottery system to get in. I think that the university should be more clear about explaining just how they gain admittance. I wish that it would be possible to increase the capacity so that it would accept more children, especially the poor. Sir, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, do you have a closing message for our listeners? Yes. I would hope that everyone listening out there pays attention to the fact that you are sent back to help others, to show love towards others, that you are sent back with a mission. The mission starts with the young. You have to make sure that the young understand that God truly exists. You have to assure that family structures remain strong. And you have to assure that the governments that control much of what takes place every day Govern in a manner that follows the teachings of God. Today you're seeing your politicians, many members of the educational system, many of those in power, many of the wealthy. You're seeing these people turn away from the teachings of God. The teachings are common sense. They are very important. The United States was founded under the teachings of God. It is highly critical that his words become a part of, every, of everyone's life during the times that they are given on earth. Simply do what is right. Simply help the young. Focus on the young. They are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. And... If they are led astray, there will basically be no help for the future of our country. 
So thank you for allowing me to speak today. I appreciate it. And I hope that people will continue to support the charities and many of the institutions that we tried to start. Thank you so much, sir. You've given out a lot of wisdom. Our next guest is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Connie. Thank you for allowing me to come through tonight. Okay. Most of your family joined the Episcopal Church, but you remained a member of the Moravian Church. How did the Moravian Church affect your life? The Moravian Church is a more simple institution, very similar to the Quaker faith that John's attended all of his life. I felt that the Moravian Church would give me a a foundation. I didn't, there were things going on in the Episcopal Church, it was more liberal. I felt in my heart that the teachings of the Moravian Church would be more beneficial as I lived my life. Sadly, I, I did draw away from much of the teachings of the Moravian Church. I wish that I had paid more attention towards some of the teachings, especially those of charity and helping others. But I felt that my business practices would allow me to do more for people, but I I confess that I became more interested in making money than I did in helping others. But the Moravian Church is a wonderful institution, and it still is. I simply wish that I had paid more attention to it. What was your opinion towards women? Sadly, I did not have a good opinion towards women. It was a time that they did not vote. It was a time that women not, were not as well educated. It was a time that women were not part of the business community. I could not believe that a woman would be capable of doing many of the things that I did, making the decisions I needed to do, making hard decisions that would affect others. I see now that as women have become better educated and have gained equal rights with men, that they are totally equal. I wish that I had understood this fact. I wish that I had helped women to advance in the business community. I could have done much. I could have done much for to hire women. I could have educated them. There were many things that I could have done, but sadly I did not. But I was totally wrong in how I felt about women. You gave $1 million to start the Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Was this your only philanthropic effort? I gave money to some other charities and institutions. I tried to support the Moravian Church at times. Sadly, I could have done much more. The Keep in fact that in the, at the time that I gave the money to start the university, a million dollars was a, a lot of money. I should have probably given much more. I should have built a larger foundation for the university, and I should have done other institutions. But I did do other contributions. I just simply did not do what I should have done. What inspired you to start the Vanderbilt University? I'm sad to say that it was basically my second wife's idea. She felt that with our great wealth, we needed to give some back. 
She was in favor of educating women. She was a women's right advocate. She felt that the Nashville community needed an institution of higher learning. And she was the driving force behind what I did. Okay, it currently costs over $70,000 a year to attend Vanderbilt University. Do you, do you see any problem with this? What was your opinion towards philanthropy? I felt that philanthropy was a good thing, but I became so involved in trying to create personal wealth that I, as I said earlier, did not do what I should have done. I think that the cost of Vanderbilt University is incredibly high. If I would have given a lot more money to the school so that they could have set up a fund to help pay for education, that if manage if the local or if the current management had done what they should should have done, that tuition could be much lower than what what we're seeing today. Vanderbilt still has a large endowment. Sadly, today I think many institutions are more interested in building the size of their endowment than they are in reducing the expense and cost for the children that want to attend the university. Once again, a very small percentage of children are admitted to the school, even though many, many of them are qualified to go there and would do well. If I had it to do over, I would create an endowment that would generate much more funds for those who wish to attend the school. Why were you not a big fan of philanthropy? I became so involved in wanting to build personal wealth. I built great mansions. I built homes. I did many, many things. Sadly, I wish I would have put some of that money towards helping others. But it was a time that they called the golden age. There were many of my people that I knew, my friends that had great wealth. I think that it was a time that we tried to impress our friends and to just how much wealth we had accumulated. It's like keeping a scorecard. And I guess we never really acknowledge the fact that we're not going to take this with us when we die. I made many mistakes, and sadly, I could have done much more with my wealth. How were you judged when you went to the other side? When I went to the other side, they were quick to point out how they had blessed me, how they had given me excessive amounts of wealth, and how I had used that not in the manner in which God had preferred. They stressed that they had blessed my my life. And they stressed that in my life plan, I had agreed to do great charitable things. I had failed to do that. They informed me that they were in my future lives that I would not be blessed with great wealth, but that I would be put in positions to understand the feelings of those that need financial help. I was also told that I would not advance in the realms because of the way I had lived my life. I was told that I would actually have to drop back a realm and that it would take multiple lifetimes of doing God's will to return to the point that I had been when I returned for this lifetime. 
I was not judged well, but I was judged in the manner of which I deserve to be judged. What level are you on now that you're on the other side? I'm now on the fifth level. When I returned, I was on the sixth, and had I followed the life plan, I could have probably advanced. What would you tell anyone who has great wealth and is still in their human body? I would tell anyone with great wealth that they need to help others. There are so many people out there living in poverty. I would tell them that the fact that they are blessed with great wealth means that they also, as part of their life plan, had agreed to help others with that great wealth. Everyone that is so blessed is expected to do their share in helping others. If they fail to do that, when they return, there will definitely be penalties. They are given a very short human life to do as much good as they can do. Building great personal wealth is not, base, is not doing good for others. God does not want you to give all of your wealth away. He wants you to be comfortable. He wants you to be happy. But he wants you to use the blessings that he gives you to help others. Life is really that simple. So what, what would you tell them as to why charity is so important? Charity is incredibly important because it helps others. Charity is short-term. Philanthropy is long-term. There are many people that are having trouble feeding their families. It takes charity to help those people. In the long term, they need education and, and ways to find work. That is where philanthropy comes into play. In philanthropy, you start educational institutions. You start places to teach vocations. You teach people how to find work. But charity is immediate. As you look around, you're now seeing many, many people harmed by the, what's taking place in the economy. The cost of living is making it very difficult for people to feed their families. It is a time where charity is needed. Philanthropy is needed for the long term, but charity is very important for the short term. Did your conscience ever bother you in life that you did not do more to help people? Somewhat, but I hate, I hate to admit it, but I got myself so involved with building my personal wealth and wanting to show those around me just how much I had that I really did not let it personally bother me as much. As I grew closer to the time that I knew I would be passing, it bothered me more. But I still failed to take actions. When you died, you left a relatively small amount of your money to your second wife and your eight daughters. Why did you do this? It goes back to, I guess, my basic concept. I, I had a phobia against women. My second wife, I had already put a million dollars into the university. My daughters, I felt, had married well and could do well on their own. So I left almost 95% of all my holdings to my son. It was, it was a, a grave mistake. I should have paid more attention. I should have tried to help my family more. I built great dissension in my will. I guess I should have anticipated it, and as I watched from this side, I knew that I'd made a great mistake. Yeah. Did money ever bring you happiness? Oh, absolutely. I enjoyed my wealth. I enjoyed the buildings, my homes. 
I enjoyed the travel. I guess I felt that it would never end, but I found out differently. Death is the great equalizer, and I can assure you that I did not take any of it with me. When I got to the other side and I watched, I realized just how much unhappiness that I really did cause with the way that I had lived my life. What do you consider the most important lesson that you learned in your human life? I learned that I should have been more conscious of helping others. I especially should have learned of the equality of women. I should have helped women. I should have given them more employment. I should have paid them more money. I should have done many things. My attitude towards women was probably my my greatest mistake in life. As I look back, I understand that how I handled my finances was a great problem. Thank you for joining us and enlightening our listeners and Barry and I. Do you have a final message for us? Yes. I would hope that those of you out there that are listening would learn from my mistakes. I was a great businessman. I took advantage of others. I built I built great businesses. I accumulated immense wealth. In doing so, I hurt many other people. I could have done much more. I could have done more for my employees. I could have done more for those around me. I wish, I truly wish that I had done more charity and philanthropy. It was a very difficult time when I lived. People needed great help. There were people that, I guess the only way I could say that I stepped upon their lives, I damaged many lives. When I came back, I was judged for it. I deserved to be judged harshly. I guess I could have even been judged more harsh. I know that my future lives, I'm going to pay the price for what I did. I will have to make up to people for what harm I caused them. When you are blessed, so you should pass those blessings on to others. I would hope that that is the one true message that comes out of my speaking with you tonight. So thank you for allowing me to come through. I hope that people will listen to my words, and I hope that they will learn the lesson of faith, hope, and charity. Thank you so much. Our next guest is John D. Rockefeller. Mr. Rockefeller, welcome. Uh, You made your great wealth by purchasing oil refineries, placing them under the name of Standard Oil, and basically monopolizing the oil business in the United States. Did you see anything wrong with this type of business practice? At the time, no, I did not. It was a new industry. Those around me were taking advantage of the opportunities. Those around me were building massive businesses. Those around me were taking advantage of every opportunity. They were not dealing fairly in many instances. They were making deals. They were building monopolies. You see, when I was building Standard Oil, it was an entirely new industry. By having very aggressive competitive techniques, it was possible to force others to sell their businesses to me. 
I took advantage of that. I know that I did things in building my wealth that were not right. They were not moral. But you have to look at the times. Great fortunes were being built. It's referred to as the golden age. My contemporaries were building mansions. They were doing, they were traveling for the first time. The world was opening up. World travel was becoming possible. It was, it was a time where sadly it was very easy to take advantage of others. Okay, during the 1890s, you started to turn your attention to charities and philanthropy. What changed you? I realized as I looked around that there were so many people that were hurting. I understood the words of God. When I would attend churches, I would realize that I was doing things, that I was not listening to the words that were being spoken. I realized that I had much more than I really could ever spend. I realized that charity was very important. I would be getting messages. I would dream. I would find myself in a burning hell for what the way I was living my life. I realized that I could not have generated the great wealth that I accumulated without having God bless me. Yes, but... I'm sorry, sir. Many people never come to that realization. I know that it's a difficult concept. Many people just want to accumulate as much wealth as possible to spend it, to live as elaborately as they can, to travel, to impress all the other wealthy people in the world. But I came to the realization that God was very real, and I did not want to face him without showing him that I had consideration for others. Okay, by the time you died in 1937, you gave away more than $500 million. Do you think this made up for the abuses of the Standard Oil Monopoly? Probably not. But there was no way that I could ever gauge that. I tried to do many things with the money that would help others. I knew that what I considered salvation was going to depend on what I did, how I made up for the decisions of my earlier business career. My businesses continued to generate great, great wealth. I tried to do as much as I could to help as many people as I could in the time that I had left. I did, I did as much as I could to make up for the abuses that I did to others in my business career. What role did Andrew Carnegie play in your growing interest in philanthropy? Andrew and I became friends. We discussed. We discussed a lot of things. Andrew and I did much to build monopolies together. 
we both came to the realization that we had accumulated far more than we could ever need or that our families would ever need. Andrew did much to try to help others. I tried to do as much as I could to help others as well. But I think between us, we played off of each other and perhaps even tried to outdo the other in our giving and in our charity. Will you expand on what your religious beliefs were? I always believed in God. There were times that I ignored that belief. There were times that I felt I needed proof. But I realized that it was only through his blessings that I could possibly have done the successes that I did. There were times during my career that the public was highly offended by my actions. There were times that I was under great pressure. There were times that people passed laws for antitrust. President Roosevelt was very emphatic about breaking the monopolies. There were probably 20 years of my life where I was incredibly unhappy, where I was under constant pressure. My health was failing. It was really not until I started to understand that I needed to help others that I started to really find happiness in my life. And it was only through strengthening my my religious beliefs that helped guide me and helped to show me what I needed to do. So your religious beliefs were in conflict with your actions in building Standard Oil. Yes. I let my desire for power and wealth overcome the background of my religious beliefs. Why did you wait so long in your life to begin your philanthropy? I think it took all those years of unhappiness and pressure. I think that was God's way of showing me the karma that I needed to understand so that I would change my life. I realized as I started to do good things for people that it brought me much more happiness than I had as people were trying to break up my trusts and monopolies. The pressure of my later life was just so much better than the pressure that I lived under when I was trying to build this great wealth. What would you tell our listeners about the blessings of God in the creation of that wealth? I would tell them that anyone that builds great wealth has been blessed by God. I would tell them that they need to understand that simple fact. And I would tell them that they need to return those blessings. Once I came over here, I truly understood. They showed me where they had guided me and where they had tried to help me. They also showed me where I had gone astray. They showed me where I had hurt people in building that great wealth. They showed me that it is possible to build wealth without damaging others. They showed me many things, but the main thing they showed me was that all things point to the blessings of God. You supported many great educational institutions. What is your opinion of higher education today? In many instances, I I am saddened by the direction that higher education has taken. At many institutions, 
it has become a place only for the elite and the rich. You see, many people that cannot afford such institutions are capable of great learning, and they're capable of doing many, many great things. What we need to see more of are institutions using these huge endowments to provide education for people that otherwise cannot afford it. You're seeing people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get their children into a college. I would prefer if we would see simple institutions, places of vocational learning, places that would teach people to get a job. You see, higher education is not required for everyone. We need carpenters, plumbers, mechanics, people to make things work every day, to repair things. Everyone deserves a vocational or educational opportunity. Let the individuals make the decisions what they will do with those educations. Totally agree with that. You developed the concept of the conditional grant. Would you explain how a conditional grant works? We would give money to charities with the requirement that they would match the funds. We did not want them just simply taking the money and spending it and having the and that would be the end of the of the gift. I wanted the endowments that we did to have a continuing help for people. By forcing institutions to match our contributions, we assured longevity in the institutions in which we were investing. You endowed the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913 with $182 million. Are you satisfied with the work of that foundation today? Yes and no. The foundation has done much good through the years. But in modern times, they are becoming more inclined towards following the political winds by trying to do to influence decision making I wish that they would stick to the basics I wish that they would use the huge funds available to them to educate the young to not oversimplify the projects in which they become involved. I wish that they would put the concepts of the teachings of God more to the forefront of their activities. I wish that they would do less to respond to political pressures. But all in all, I think that they have accomplished much. Okay, you supported the passage of the 18th Amendment that banned alcohol in the United States. What would you tell our listeners about the trend towards alcohol and drug legalization today? I think that it is a disaster. I'm seeing the legalization of drugs. I'm watching your cities be destroyed by drug addiction. I'm watching people being given places in the public to use illegal drugs. These people have no interest. As long as they are not shown how to help themselves to improve their lives. When a drug addict is encouraged to use illegal drugs, he is not being encouraged to stop the addiction to educate himself, to raise his family, 
to do all of the things that are required for humanity to advance. Alcohol, alcohol affects many, many lives in a negative manner. It causes divorce, violence, causes many things. I think if people would just simply step back, stay away from the illegal drugs and alcohol, they would live better lives. Yeah. So did you consider yourself humane towards your competitors? I tried to consider myself fair. I was very hard. I would push them. I would try to make as much as I could. But I considered myself fair in my dealings. Many of my competitors did not agree with my opinion, but that was how I felt. Thank you so much, sir. Do you have a final message for us? Yes, I would like to thank you most of all for allowing me to speak. Humans need help. They need education. They need to focus on the young. The young needs to be educated. All of the young deserve an equal education. They need to be shown how to find work, and they need to be steered away towards drug addiction, towards violence, towards gangs, towards many of the things that just will destroy civilization. Technology is in many ways is leading you away from the simple teachings of God that will lead you to successful evolution. I hope that all of you that are listening step back and assess your lives. Decide how you can help others. Decide if you are doing what is best. Make a decision to help. Charity. Do as much as you can for others. Show love. Do not show hatred. Do what you need to help others, and you will find that you will find true happiness. So thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. I thank all three of you for giving a wonderful message to our listeners. Okay, thanks so much. That was really interesting. Now, next week, we're going to be channeling the spirits of George Orwell, author of 1984 and Animal Farm. We're also going to have John Steinbeck, author of Grapes of Wrath, and even Jules Verne, author of 2,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It's going to be interesting to see how these individuals received a glimpse into the future. Tuesdays at 9 p.m. Pacific Time on Voice America Variety Network, Connie and I are doing a radio show entitled Spirits Speak, Analyzing the Afterlife. Please join us. Tell your friends about it. Now, my eighth book, Messages of God for Modern Worlds, available in English and Spanish, in soft cover, ebook. It's on Amazon. Compilation of 60 messages from Jesus that we channeled on our Wednesday morning podcast. It's a great daily devotional. The book's available on Kindle for immediate download. Please tell your friends about it. Please support it. It is truly the words of God. So, we hope that you enjoyed our show tonight. Thank you for listening. Please join us Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the Parax Radio Network. And I would also like to thank you all for listening this evening. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and God bless you all. Thanks for listening to Channeling History. Tune in again next week for another electrifying episode as we never know who will make an appearance or who will come through the portal. Any rebroadcast or release of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2020. Our story begins by Kevin McLeod, licensed through Incompetech.com. Incompetech.com.